All right. Thanks for having me. And I am really excited for this conference. I can't wait for this to happen in person. Um, and uh, I'm really excited for this topic because we talk a lot about, you know, the science of reading and the science of math. And even sometimes like in Facebook groups and such, there's not a lot of science in the discussions. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is the science of instruction. And we can do that regardless of what core programs we might be using. If we can understand the science of instruction, then as teachers, as leaders, it's low hanging fruit to get better results for kids in math. So I want to uh, give you a QR code to go directly to a book that you can download and read electronically for free, or you can print it if you are so inclined. It's about 128 pages. Um, it is, you will not be asked for your email. You will not be asked for your contact information. You will not be contacted by marketing. This is a free math MTSS book that Paul Meiskins and I have written together. And uh, we do write uh, about uh, spring math in the book. It is also a manual for spring math. But if you are not using spring math, don't worry about it. The first half of every chapter is just about how to do math in TSS. So I hope that will be useful to folks and that you will uh, take advantage of that resource. Okay. So this is all the news, right? This is what everybody is talking about, that we've had the largest declines in, in all these years since 1990. And at the end of the day, I think that's a big giant red herring. We knew we were gonna have learning loss. Let's just stop talking about it. I don't wanna talk about COVID anymore. I mean, it because what I mean by that is it happened. We cannot change that that happened. But I think this is the real problem. The real problem that no one really seems to be talking about is that there's been absolutely no improvement. This is a picture of my son from his babyhood until he graduated high school a year ago in May. And performance on the NAEP for the average fourth grade kid it was absolutely flat. There was no improvement from, you know, that is a 20 year interval, basically. So that's unconscionable to me. That's what is worrisome to me that we should be talking about. How can we get better results for students? And oh, by the way, the average fourth grade kid in our country is not in the minimally proficient range on the NAEP. So um, in this session, I want to talk about really the science of instruction, how children actually learn according to the science. I'm a behavior analyst, so I'm going to put a behavioral lens on it. But obviously, these concepts translate. So whatever your framework is, I'm just going to ask you to be open to this and think about how this could fit into your work. Apply the lens of the science of math and evaluating core curricula and instructional practices in your classrooms. You know, we are first and foremost stewards. We have to be good stewards of the instructional time resource that is available to us that we are going to allocate. And that means we have to pay attention to effect and cost so we can make wise decisions and get better results for students. <clears throat> and then finally, I hope you will take away some ideas to update and supplement your practices to align with the science of math so that you can get better learning gains. Obviously, we are talking about the science of math, so the science matters. And I want to encourage you to go to these sites to get more information. I know you have these slides, so you should be able to click on each of these links. My absolute favorite is going to be the National Center on Intensive Intervention and their tools chart. I understand the desire to crowdsource ideas sometimes. I use, you know, recipe apps and uh, TripAdvisor and things like that, so I get it. But I think you have to begin with a set of um, curricula or interventions or assessment tools that basically can work if they are properly used and then evaluate which is the best fit and then evaluate which is the least cost, not just in dollars to purchase it, but in time, in errors that all systems have errors. So in errors, um, in, in the needed uh, implementation support to make it work. And then on the other side of that, crowdsource at the end when you've narrowed it down to a couple of good options. That's that's my advice on that. Okay. Uh, I just uh, came across this work from Ed Week. The journalist is Schwartz. And this was a poll that was conducted by Ed Week with uh, about 300 teachers responding. And I just found it very interesting because the results of this poll are somewhat alarming. So uh, there's pattern of findings that says that basically 
teachers are not really using a core math instructional program and following it closely for the most part. That means teachers are picking and choosing what they use. That's the biggest category there, the dark blue. And the things that they sort of routinely report uh, getting um, materials from, for example, or what materials they use in the classroom, the number one is free materials from online and lesson sharing websites. And that's a little bit of a red flag to me because what you find online might not be aligned with excellent science of instruction. And so you have to be able to apply this lens to this work so that you can select things that will actually have a prayer of working in your classroom. Um, I also think that it was encouraging teachers reported sort of in, for the most part, in tandem assessment of um, procedural skill development and um, conceptual work or problem solving, <coughs> both of which emerge in tandem. This is a pretty settled question according to the science. So I actually found this result um, somewhat encouraging. The dark blue is that teachers are teaching these at the same time in tandem. I mean, I sure have seen a lot of teachers for which that's not true. So uh, again, poll of 300 teachers, self-report, maybe take it with a grain of salt, but that was the result for that. And uh, I'll skip over this one, but I want to show this one. Um, this one is alarming to me because uh, it is reporting that teachers are really tending to use um, this tactic called productive struggle. And in my world, I do think there is a possibility that that could work uh, as an effective tactic if you are using it when children are in the mastery range of performance and you are using it as a generalization strategy. But I am not sure that teachers are situating it that way in their classrooms. I run into teachers who try to use productive struggle as uh, an acquisition tactic in their classroom. And that is certainly something that we could based on the evidence and the research, we could say that could cause children to really experience anxiety, to experience a very high error rate, no doubt, um, to experience frustration. And it, it's not a concept or a tactic that is just sort of universally supported by evidence. It's not. I, I, I hold out a little hope for it because I don't think it has been studied, situated in student proficiency levels. So probably good teachers who say they use it and it works well for them, I would be very curious if they are sort of naturally using it as more of a generalization tactic in their classrooms. Here's more sources for you that you can go to and read. Uh, I'm following these journalists and I've given you their Twitter handles. Um, and of course, this fine paper at the bottom that was authored by our wonderful colleagues, Sarah Powell, Elizabeth Hughes, and Corey Peltier earlier, uh, I guess a year ago now, just about. And it is a wonderful paper. I encourage you to check all of that out. So, all right, here's where we are. There is a pattern of evidence since 1997 that when you look for the you know, principles, ingredients of effective instructional design in commercially available math core curricula, the results are pretty dismal. And this is not one study. This is not one curriculum. This is not one study one time. It, these studies are actually hard to do because they're politically contentious, right? And in fact, in the Dobler et al. paper, which is so fantastic from 2012, they evaluate three curricula and they don't say which ones they are. And I'm sure there's a reason they don't name them. And, and the other reason it's hard to do is it's hard to stay ahead of the vendors. So what happens is by the time the study is completed, the vendors say, we're on a new edition and everything has changed. So your data do not apply. So it's actually really a problem for frontline practitioners when they start talking about for math curricula. So let's just look at the pattern of available evidence. And the pattern of available evidence is that if you look for these ingredients as specified by Chris Dobler in his great paper from 2012, um, and you specifically evaluate math curricula for these active ingredients, <clears throat> you're gonna find, as he did, that you know, less than half, fewer than half, and in, in the case of the fourth grade um, <clears throat> analyses, only one third of opportunities were there. Those, those ingredients existed, only one, one third met the minimum criteria. 
So it is not surprising to me that then when you look at the research on core curriculum effects, the effect sizes are actually just unimpressive. This is not going to be the place to put your uh, hope and effort and allocate your uh, time and energy with the expectation that on the other side of that, your achievement scores in math are going to go up. So my takeaway, my advice to people all the time is that you need to supplement. You need to certainly, if you want to be thoughtful about how you adopt a new curriculum, my advice would be to implement a strong class-wide intervention um, effort in your school, 15 minutes per day, and use that to uh, hedge against the pain and the learning loss that will happen when you adopt a new core curriculum, especially since the effect sizes for math core curricula are, for the most part, the pattern is a near zero effect, okay? Um, and I've given you a link to a wonderful rubric that's based on Chris Dobler's um, 2012 paper developed by a colleague, Kay Anderson, in uh, North Dakota. She's not at this conference. She's at the North Dakota conference. That's a little typo on my slide. And uh, it is a wonderful rubric that your teams could use to look at your own core math curricula. The, o the only, uh, the other um, uh, advice I want to give you, two more pieces, is the IES practice guide. So you can also consider the evidence for these specific active ingredients in instruction in math. And you want to make sure, and I'm sure other presenters have been talking about these recommendations, that these activities are embedded in your instruction every single day. So another way to look at the quality of your instruction is to pay attention to the work of NCII. I mean, in effect, they are also compelled by this body of evidence that I've just very quickly detailed for you in that they are now saying, hey, vendors, please evaluate your tools as containing these necessary dimensions of effective uh, uh, instructional design. And they are articulating these ingredients um, according to this table. So you could also take a look at that as you think about the core program of instruction in your school. And I will also tell you, I mean, it would have been so tidy if you could just put kids on a computer and give them instruction or give them intensified instruction or intervention, we might call it, and that it would just work because wouldn't that be easy and low cost? But unfortunately, it just doesn't work. I mean, the data on those particular models are under overwhelming. So I, this is my takeaway. This is my conclusion from the research is that the teacher really is the heart and soul of the effect size. So I believe the tools that we use, however we define those, instructional calendars, which is a way of pacing instruction according to specific standards, uh, embedded uh, formative assessment in your core program of instruction. Um, <clears throat> what else might we think about? Uh, adopting, you know, standards, unpacking standards, professional development activities, technology tools and platforms, data warehouses and such, assessments. These are all things, we're going to call them tools in this graphic, that really work through the teacher to enable just in time, right in time, more effective teaching on the spot with this feedback loop coming from the student and the only way I know how to do this in all of my years of doing this work is to leverage MTSS as the framework to drive this particular model. So I think about how does learning happen, obviously, from a, the behavioral science perspective. And I know others who have presented maybe are sort of bring a slightly different lens to it. That's OK. This should translate for you. But basically, the instructional hierarchy to me is the most important innovation that has happened in 100 years in education. I mean, just it's right there with formative assessment. And the reason I say that is if you don't have the instructional hierarchy as part of your understanding of formative assessment, then all you have is the collection of assessment data without any clear in, you know, direction on what to do with it, how to change what you're doing instructionally from day to day. And this is what I want to unpack for you today. 
So we know when children are learning a new understanding that what we need to be doing is focusing on discrimination, correct discrimination. And that's a behavioral kind of jargon term, but it just means that the child understands how and when to correctly respond. Um, we know that this is, we don't care how fast they are. We know that this is where errors are likely to occur. And once children reach independent, accurate performance, they move into what's called the instructional range of performance. And now uh, we want to give children fluency building opportunities. And they need this because if they don't attain a certain level of fluency, that's kind of code for the correct response is easy to give, they are going to struggle and not be able to profit from generalization. Generalization is like free learning. This is when a child <clears throat> can adapt the response to solve a new problem or can encounter uh, a more challenging problem iteration and learn how to do it faster. And that's economy and in instruction. So if you leave fluency off the table, if you do not uh, provide timed practice, which is a recommended IES practice for students, you're actually harming and worsening le learning. So if this you know, is something that makes you uncomfortable, and I just encourage you to dig into that a little bit because you are leaving learning on the table. You are not serving your children adequately if you are not giving them the opportunity to build fluency. Okay, here's why. So if this is a scatter plot of uh, fluency scores on the x-axis plotted against um, accuracy scores on the y-axis. And when you plot it this way, the pattern will always look this way. It looks this way for reading. It looks this way for learning to play a musical instrument. It looks this way for learning, period. Okay, this is multiplication. These are This is a multiplication task. And in this case, case, if a teacher uses accuracy, they might say these are the children who are ready for more challenging work. We can just move them forward into new tasks, new, more complex understandings. And we know that children who are to the left of this line and this dashed line are in the frustrational range of performance. And the frustrational range of performance is frustrating for children in part, it can be, because this is where all of the errors are. Children in this phase of learning, this is where they are making errors. So this means instructionally, we're gonna do different things to provide instructional support to students who are in the acquisition stage of learning. And you can be sort of loose with this in your core in the sense that if you as a teacher are introducing new content for the day, you should be, you know, embedding in your instructional interactions during that uh, period, you should be embedding all kinds of acquisition support. And acquisition support is designed to promote correct performance, correct, independent, accurate performance, okay? In the instructional range of performance, now this phase of learning is characterized by your period of most rapid growth. So if you give the right instructional opportunity, which is high dosages of high quality practice, this can look like games, this can also truly look like flashcards and worksheets and response cards, choral responding, all of the things that allow children to have a, a class-wide math intervention, a high dosage of opportunities to respond at the right level of task difficulty. And then when you hit a certain degree of fluency, See, children will be in the mastery range of performance, and this is where we're talking. This is what we're trying to get children to, and this is where you see flexible, adaptable skill use, retention of the learned skill over time, faster learning of complex related content, the capacity to solve word problems without a lot of labor or a lot of a high error rate. This is what we're after, and I think what happens is people teachers don't always have this lens on their instructional episodes to where they know what they're focusing on. I encourage teachers to divide your core into one-third acquisition support, one-third fluency building, one-third application. And now you understand, I hope, that that means you would have to target three different skills to do that in your class period each day, because you can't possibly give generalization opportunities for something that children have not yet acquired. If you do, you will actually worsen learning. Uh, the other problem that happens if you just use accuracy is you're wrong. All these kids in that circle actually scoot that circle to the left a little bit. It moved a little on my slide. Um, those are children who basically are, we know they're in trouble. They're going to 
not be 100% accurate. They are going to forget what they have learned. They are going to have errors in their future experiences. They are not going to profit when you move them forward. They're going to be in trouble. We call those false negative errors. We want to move as many kids as possible into the green circle, which again, scooted a little bit to the left, because we know that that is where flexible, enduring, generalizable, useful uh, learn skills live. And th that this is just a graphic showing you that what, ha what happens when you give the right instruction in the frustrational range of performance is that errors will go down, which is the red. Uh, correct performance will go up. You get an uptick when you give a high dosage of response uh, opportunities, opportunities to respond when you move into the instructional range, which is really cool. Um, and then performance will level out when you move into the mastery range. But again, the key is you have to be adjusting what you're doing instructionally, which is what I am going to teach you today. And I am going to use um, a video of my cat learning to ring a bell to, to do this. So <laughs> I hope it'll be a little entertaining. And then we're going to do it for a real math problem. So, all right. Uh, excellent acquisition instruction begins with sequencing tasks very, very intentionally. Uh, I just love Engelman's writing in this space because he is masterful about articulating how so many misconceptions, specifically in math, can be avoided if you have really careful task control. This is part of why it's alarming when you hear about teachers getting materials online from teachers, you know, teachers pay teachers, those kinds of sites which are so popular, because the control of the task materials, you know, myself, I, I've done this work for 20 years, it's really hard to build well-controlled task materials. That is not an easy undertaking. So in math, skills are never taught in isolation. So you have to have a very careful task analysis that underlies the work that you are doing in your classroom. You need to know where to, what are the prerequisite understandings so that you can begin with grade level challenging content, but also verify that children have mastered the necessary prerequisites to, to be able to acquire the new understanding that you are trying to give them. Um, you need to verify that they are fluent on the prerequisites. Fluency just makes the work easy. I, that is a Kent Johnson quote, and I love his work. Um, it, is a, it is a gift that you give a child that makes the correct performance easier to do. It makes the work more enjoyable. Kent Johnson always says fluency is what you do when no one's watching, right? I mean, it, you could probably relate to this as an adult. Like you're not going to, it's hard to go sit down and practice the piano when you're just learning to play the piano because you're not very good at it. But when you're masterful at it, you may play for fun. This is what happens in life. Well, that can happen in math too. You just have to orchestrate that as a teacher. Using, of course, an instructional calendar to map essential skills for the year, note when each skill is expected to be mastered, and make sure you are checking for that mastery. Um, I have instructional calendars for grades K through 8 that I use and we make available in our support portal, um, but basically you got to have a great task analysis. And just as a concrete model of what I mean by that, although I bet a lot of you are following that, no problem, um, is you begin with what is the goal skill? What is it that I am teaching today that children need to understand how to do? This is, by the way, exactly how we would build an intervention, an intensified instructional episode for, for kids who are needing a tier two or tier three intervention. Start with the goal skill. If they are at mastery, you're good. If they are in the instructional range, then you would give them a fluency building intervention for the goal skill. If they are in the frustrational range, we would drop down and assess the most proximal prerequisite understanding. And if you look at this, you can see what we're doing is isolating whether or not they can regroup. So if they can now perform in the mastery range, when you take the regrouping requirement away, then they're going to get an acquisition intervention that's focused on regrouping grouping, which is the goal skill. If they're instructional, we're going to build proficiency first. We're going to get them to fluency before we move them to the goal skill. And if they're in the frustrational range, we are going to drop down again. And that is just the logical flow of how, that's this is how I build intervention in MTSS and math. Um, this is also how I would deliver core instruction in terms of understanding, do children have the necessary prerequisite understandings to profit? And once you know where you land, then you simply move move forward, move kids back up until you get to the goal skill. So if you start in sums to 12, when they reach the mastery criterion, you move them to sums to 20. When they master that, you move them to the next one until you arrive at the goal skill. That is a su successful intervention. That is a great model even to embed in your core instruction. 
So the goal of excellent acquisition instruction is discrimination. And discrimination is de defined as understanding the conditions under which a response is correct or incorrect, okay? And you need to exercise the ABCs. So this is just like managing disruptive behavior. Learning is a behavior. You can manage it with antecedent behavior, kind of consequence understanding. And that's what I wanna sort of teach you how to do today, okay? So I would, I would, I'm going to work on animating this for future talks. I had a little trouble uh, making it animate like I wanted, but you, you start here, you start with task presentation. All right. And then you monitor student responding. What was the accuracy of the response? What was the quality of the response? Was the response easy and immediately displayed or was it labored? If the response is incorrect, then you're going to give corrective feedback and you're going to most likely add antecedent support and then present the task again. So you're gonna go this way. If the response is correct, you're gonna affirm the response. There will be some, there could be more elaborate sort of affirmation of the correct response, or it could be less elaborate based on um, how far along children are in their understanding. And then you're going to most likely advance the task difficulty. So you can exercise antecedent control in that arrangement. So, you know, when you add antecedent support, what is what does that include? At the task level, that means, first of all, using well-controlled, well-designed tasks. That's actually really important. Um, using worked examples is really important. So you have to remember, you're working with novice learners, not expert learners. So being able to, to ex use explicit instruction to really specify how a problem has been solved, to unpack that. Um, for example, you know, number talks is a popular intervention. And I was on a talk for Ed Week a couple of weeks ago, and the, that was the major response when teachers were asked, how do you build fluency? Most people said number talks. It, it would be based on the science of instruction, a terrible fluency building intervention. It is not an appropriate fluency building intervention. It could be a useful acquisition intervention where you have children modeling their thinking, their strategies for other children in a, a mediated discussion in your classroom so that children can understand how and why certain responses are correct or incorrect. And worked examples should be part of that. Um, this is the place for guided support. You don't want to allow errors to occur and not be detected. This is part of why productive struggle, struggle and inquiry-based learning are so deadly when they are placed in the acquisition phase of learning because that process in, actually really allows for and encourages uh, errors happening and errors are deadly when they occur in the acquisition phase of learning. We know this from year, decades of behavioral science. This is not like a new understanding. So what we wanna do is use guided support. This means it's not homework, it's not independent work. We want children to be getting cues for correct responding and certainly immediate error correction, which is a consequence strategy. We wanna uh, pre, hopefully, I hope Paul Riccomini presented at this conference. I bet he did. If he did, I bet he talked about uh, vocabulary. I, I follow his work for that very closely. Um, and you want to pre-teach vocabulary and integrate language into your math lessons on the antecedent end. Then in the behavior category, management of student responding, what is that? Well, it's hands-on until you get instructional level performance. In the acquisition phase of learning, the most important dimension of managing student response and responding is that an adult has to be engaged. You're watching that, okay? Um, can you can. A, I'm sorry. Can we take a quick pause? We had something come in the chat as yeah. you talk about um, uh, instructional and, and intervention tactics. We did have a question in the chat um, from someone who works at a virtual school. Are there any free high quality instruction or intervention materials? Um, teachers create their own things, use teachers, pay teachers. Our interventionists don't have anything. If you have any suggestions for that, I can pop the links in the chat. No, I mean, honestly, to be honest, I am 
very aware that there are no free materials. So even meaning if you can get them or download them for free, they are not free. OK, so whatever that tactic is, you need to be evaluating it in terms of do you have the necessary materials and skills to pull it off? Um, do you require professional development support in your classroom to do it? What is the amount of instructional time that that is going to require? Like one of the pieces of advice that I occasionally used to see, I think I've probably <laughs> responded enough that maybe people are not saying it as much, but like the same idea comes up when when people people on the Science of Math Facebook page tell people to go build their own math assessments as if that's a an easy, quick, free undertaking that's going to result in high quality data points to allow us to make good decisions. That process is not. I mean, having built math assessments most of my career, um, the, both times I, mil I built a probe generator, it took over three years. We generated and tested over 50,000 problems. Um, we ran a program of research to validate these materials. So free is never free. And I, and I would just encourage you to if you are looking at things that you don't actually have to pay money to use, also ask, how much time does it take? What is the effect size? And what I'm going to tell you to do, honestly, is go to the tools chart at the National Center for Intensive Intervention. You know, not every tool is a, is a good fit for your world or your classroom or your needs, but I believe that's a good place to start. And you can get cost information. You can also get, uh, most importantly, the effect sizes for those particular materials and tactics. So that's my advice about that. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So hands-on is the key to building um, correct responding and a gradual release of support. You definitely want children thinking aloud, meaning they are talking out loud, saying what they are thinking when they are solving math problems. All right. So go here. In terms of the consequence category, this is where corrective feedback lives. So your initial dosage of corrective feedback should be immediate and dense. The goal is to catch all errors when you are in the acquisition stage of learning. When you move into um, you, your feedback is going to be more elaborate. You're going to represent the task just like I showed you in that graphic. You're probably going to add some antecedent support when you do. And feedback is more efficient and can even be delayed when you move into fluency building. All right, so I'm going to give you an example of training my cat to ring a bell. And I love this example. I'm very proud of my boy. Um, he, uh, he I, I use this example because a lot of people think you can't train a cat. And I don't want to say it was easy to do, but I got an empty nest this year and it took like thousands of trials, but we did it. All right, so let me show you this little video of what he can do. Okay, Hank, ring the bell. Bring it. <laughs> I'm so proud of him. All right. Why do we teach him to do that? Well, okay. These are the laws of behavior. This is the laws. Uh, the, if you, whatever you're going to teach, here's, here's an example with a cat. I'm going to give you an example in math, and hopefully this is going to land with you. So we chose ringing a bell because he's a natural tapper. If we had tried to teach him how to speak and actually say food, we probably would have failed at that, right? Because it's not even in his repertoire at all. That's a law of behavior change. Choose something that they can do. So with little kids, you might be choosing to point or whatever before and, and correlate respond before you teach them to write answers as just an example. So he's a natural tapper. We capitalized on that. The goal of training was to teach him to ring a bell or tap a bell specifically when his food was available. Um, his, the antecedent tactics we use, we taught him first to tap his bowl. Then we introduced the bell. Um, we kind of had a digital bell when we started and it was too hard for him to press. So we modified it. We got an easier to ring bell. You, that think about that like modifying your task materials and the management of his behavior. He gave us a lot of response variation. He rubbed our legs, he meowed, he tapped his bowl, he tapped the side of the bell. And then I gotta tell you, the thing that got him over the hump, which is amazing to me, was that three step prompt. So model it, then take his little paw and press the bell and then say, great job and give him the food. I think he cared about the food more than the praise. So what were the consequences? 
food. But I also like to think he had a little self pride. And first, we have another uh, cat, his sister, uh, both rescue all rescues and a dog and nobody got to eat until Hank rang the bell. So that was probably useful for his community. He's a he's a big leader in his community. Now he loves to ring his bell. All right. So we chose a behavior he could do. This is in the antecedent category. And then we built fluency tapping the bowl when food was available. Okay, tap it again. Tap your bowl. Okay, so he taps the bowl. We give him the food. We do, I mean, maybe a hundred trials of that. Once he got that, then we introduced um, a digital button, which failed because it was too hard for him to press. So we changed it to the bell shown here, and he would sort of, as you will see, tap the side of the bell, tap around it, slide it across the floor. And so we used a graduated prompt sequence to produce um, correct responding. Okay, ring your bell. Hank, ring your bell like this. Ring your bell. Bingo. All right. So, I mean, I've seen, I've seen modeling sort of denigrated on Twitter in the last month. And I'm thinking modeling can be very powerful. Don't leave it on the table. It's an antecedent tactic that you can use to encourage correct responding. And then once he became very facile with ringing his bell for food, he totally generalized. Um, he would he now uses tapping to communicate his desire for all kinds of things. As a specific example, we have a baby gate. We don't let our dog out of the kitchen because she's 100 years old and she TTs all over the house. So she, she's gated in the kitchen, but he doesn't always like to jump over the gate. You know, he loves food so much. He's kind of a heavy cat. So um, we have to be careful with that. So anyway, he will tap the gate now for us to open the gate so he doesn't have to jump over. And of course, we he has us very well trained because we do that for him. But that's a form of generalization. He's using tapping for other things. <laughs> and I have to tell you too, he was not starving. He just always behaves that way. He gets fed twice a day. He's just very dramatic. Okay. So now this all applies when you teach kids how to do math, it's the same science. So in terms of accuracy, that's just what it sounds like. Is the response correct? What about the quality of the child's response? Uh, is it a complete response? Can the child articulate his or her thinking? Can they, are they able to explain the math strategy that they use and using vocabulary that's appropriate to their math development? Uh, if not, you can model that. That would be antecedent support that you would embed and actually would occur probably following their response in the consequence category. So you can pre-teach it and then you can also correct for it on the back end. What about the immediacy of the response? That matters because that's the dimension of fluency which you can only get when you get some timed um, assessment uh, embedded in, in your in your program of instruction because it helps you understand how much cognitive effort they are having to allocate to getting the correct response and you want it to be minimal which which will be the case when they are sort of automatically rapidly correctly responding in other words when they become fluent okay so these are things you can do on the antecedent side and I'm going to give you some uh, clear examples of those in math so uh, you can demonstrate the solution on a number line. Let's just, we're going to work with an example of multi-digit multiplication. And in this case, um, you can demonstrate that if they know how to solve five times four and they understand conceptually that that is repeated addition, so five sets are four or four sets of five, then you can demystify on a number line that 20 times 11, and in fact, any kind of multiplication can be conceived of as repeated addition and can be estimated in terms of quantity on a number line. And what this does for kids, and this is not, this doesn't have to take days, but what this does for kids is it 
helps it, it helps what could be intimidating and scary to them feel accessible. It's really important in math. If you know how to do five times four, let me show you what 20 times 11 is and that you will know how to do this. It's not that hard. Then explicitly proof the algorithm. So it's interesting that people are often afraid to teach the algorithm. Teaching the algorithm is a really important part of acquisition core instruction. It is an antecedent uh, tactic that should begin from day one, and you can interleave this work with uh, specific strategies to cultivate conceptual understanding, but you certainly cannot exclude this and only focus on conceptual understanding. Again, that is really settled science that you have to interleave both, uh, including explicit instruction for place value understanding using expanded notation. That's the name of the game here. That's what this skill is really about. So you can give children practice in the context of the operation, working with place value, you can give explicit instruction for what we think of typically as conceptual understanding. So adults would solve this first problem as 91 times five, they would convert that immediately. If you were having to do this on the spot, you would do 90 times five plus five. That's what you would do. So you can systematically teach and practice this on the antecedent side with children so that you can enable some of these tactics for making challenging work easier. We, I, I think that is enormously important. I do that for every skill, 145 skills from kindergarten to grade eight. And we also always present opportunities to solve for unknowns. So these are more examples of using place value, uh, explicit instruction to teach um, sort of making challenging content easier to solve in the context of this multiplication um, operation. You can also deliberately cultivate understanding of conceptual understanding using the dimensions or ingredients of explicit instruction. So children should be able to articulate before you have ever taught them how to compute the uh, actual product that 31 times 12 will be a greater quantity than 31 times 11. And they should even be able to articulate how much greater it will be. And if they can't, they need to practice that. That's how you are cultivating conceptual understanding of what they are doing. What do we mean like on the antecedent side when we say drop down to a smaller slice? Well, of content. Well, when you are teaching something, if your children are not acquiring the understanding, an antecedent strategy you can use to modify your task, which we did when we changed the digital bell to the ringing bell, you can take away pieces of the instruction to make it a little bit easier, get mastery on the lower level uh, skill, and then jump right back into where you were. So for example, I gave you that graphic, the task analysis. One example would be to take away the regrouping. Um, and then it, after you've gotten children very facile, fluent with that, then introduce problems that require regrouping. Um, teaching multiple, uh, multiplying one digit by two digits before you teach one digit by three digit numbers is another concrete example of how you can drop down to a smaller slice. Now, you lose efficiency with that. So you don't have to slice everything. Like I sometimes see teachers do this and like they're only teaching like the plus twos for like two weeks. Like you might not have to do that. They might be able to acquire an, uh, the correct understanding in the context of a broader stimulus slice. That means content slice. And if, if so, you want to do that because it's more efficient and you can then get to more understanding on the other side because you're not wasting it by slicing too small. So you really need to pay attention to your slice. You might be slicing too small, but certainly if children, if you are presenting a task and children are not correctly responding, a very reasonable tactic is to drop down a slice. Um, graduated prompt sequences. This is where we took, you know, we did the model and then the guided practice and then gave the reward. So you can do that, of course, in math um, with counting, with selecting the correct quantity, with simplifying expressions. All, I mean, all math uh, performances are amenable to this where you can demonstrate the correct response, you can uh, have them correct errors that they have made in a response, you can embed an error and then ask them to fix it and give uh, sort of a gradual release of support from yourself as the adult to do that 
to do that uh, correct, for them to do that correct response. Uh, backward chaining is another great example. I mean, I could do eight hours on specific tactics you could put into your classroom and tell you how they work based on the science, but I, I don't have time to do all of that. So I'm just going to give you another example. I never see this used. I think this is a great tactic. I'll also mention all the prompt arrangements, constant time delay, for example, very powerful. Um, the, in this particular tactic, it is an antecedent tactic, but what you are doing is modifying the task so that the child only has to give you the final response, which here is adding the product, the, the partial products to get the final product. And when they can successfully do that, then you take away the next intermediate step. And then finally, you're left with the entire step. And you could even eventually take away this cue and prompt. And, as well, and when they can continue Continue to correctly respond. You, the beauty of this tactic is often you can do this with errorless learning, which is a very powerful uh, behavioral tactic. So there's that graphic. I'm going to show you in a reading example, you're already doing this. If you're a classroom teacher, you're already doing this in reading. You might not be doing this in math. So I want you to think about, and next week when we're in Pennsylvania, hopefully I will have uh, a video for math that I can show, but I'm going to show you a reading example so you can see how the science is actually really embedded in these the excellent reading instruction that this teacher is doing. Okay, this is a kid getting intervention. Amadi, today we're going to read this passage. I'm going to read it to you first, and will you follow along with me and just listen? The walk. Tommy and his dad went for a walk. They were in the woods. Okay, now I'm only reading part of it, and I want you to read what I just read. Start at the beginning and use your reading finger so I know where you are. Tommy and his dad went for a walk. They were in the woods. It was pretty that day. The sun was bright. The sun. And the end makes that a long. Long O. 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 No. Stones. Good. Stone. Stone. Right. Is it L Y at the end? Partly. I wish I could play like that. Someday you may see said. Is okay, um, so the main thing is I wanted you to see with a concrete example the ABCs that are happening there just in the context of excellent instruction. So once a child has acquired the correct performance, then you move into fluency building instruction and the antecedent behavior consequence tactics that you are using have to change. So for example, now you have to monitor uh, you have to monitor time to performance because we know when children are in the fluency range, they're probably 100% accurate. If they are not, they're probably 95% accurate. So that is it becomes a really crappy metric to track any kind of superior learning. The only way you distinguish more profi proficient performance is to give the same intervals of time when they practice so you can track growth in that way. It's a really important dimension of, of assessment that cannot be avoided without harming children. And it is a really important um, dimension as my buddy Robin Cotting and Brian Ponce have no doubt said at this conference, it's a really important dimension of um, cultivating successful, masterful math learning. So you must figure out how to make peace with how you can give timed intervals of practice and timed intervals of assessment in your classroom. Because if you don't, I you're not going to be able to make good decisions and inform your, your instruction. Doesn't mean you time all the time, but there's a really important place for that. And of course, it is recommended by the very best research that we have on the topic. At the end of the day, and I hope, boy, I hope Brian Ponce talked about this and maybe Robin too. Too. This is actually a paper from Robin Conning. It really is all about dosage when you're in fluency building. And so more frequently delivered shorter interval um, episodes will give you more robust learning over time. And this is causing many of us to need to rethink our MTSS calendars. Gosh, calendars just... <laughs> 
they are the thing we most worry about, I feel like sometimes, and for good reason, because you have to have available time to do this work with children in your, in your classroom. But at the same time, for high quality fluency building, you really don't need 30 minutes a day, typically. Um, in fact, you might get diminished returns if you allocate 30 minutes for intervention support, because children kind of lose interest and engagement on the back end of that, they can. Um, so let me just show you an example of what we found in a randomized control trial looking at dosage in a fluency building math intervention. Um, in a control just progress monitoring group, this is the, these are the gains that we got on this particular skill. And that's what we got when we had a 40 minute once per week fluency building intervention with these students, okay? No different, no different than the control, which means don't do it this way. Um, when we took that 40 minutes and we gave it in two 20 minute doses, we got that effect. And when we took the, uh, that 40 minutes and gave it in four 10 minute doses in the course of the week, which we call daily intervention, we got a much stronger effect. So the key when you are working in fluency building is you're not gonna get results if you're only doing it one day a week, or maybe a couple days a week, even if you allocate more minutes to it. So the key here is more frequent, shorter duration practice opportunities embedded throughout the day, or ideally, or embedded at least daily for your, your class to give you the progress that you want. And I'm kind of nearing the end of my um, slide deck, which is good news because I want to have plenty of time to take more questions and I can see there are lots of chat comments. Um, but I do want to kind of summarize for you uh, how doable this can feel. All right. So for me, I think about excellent, effective core math instruction as prioritizing the mastery of, you know, sort of deal breaker, non-negotiable mastery of 145 skills from numeracy to algebra. So when you think about that, you have nine years of instruction to do that. Nine years times 36 weeks, uh, we could, ooh, oh, I'm going to make a graph. Weekly rate of mastery that you have to accomplish to get kids there. You could make an aim line. But when you think about it that way, it suddenly feels very doable, right? If you had 10 years, it'd be 14.5 skills per year. You know, it doesn't exactly work that way because there's overlap and children often take a couple of years to really go from acquisition to mastery on some of the foundation understandings. And at the end of the day, though, when you hear it's 145 skills that are most essential from numeracy to algebra, then suddenly this can feel very doable for teachers. Again, I've been saying this, it really is settled science. I would send you to um, Bethany Riddle Johnson. I think she is at Vanderbilt still. And uh, I just love her 2017 um, uh, summary paper or review paper on this particular question. And if you start there, then she will send you to all the citations so you can read all of the original work, which I have done more than once. And it is very compelling that that conceptual and procedural skill emerge in concert with what we call interleaved instruction, which just means you're never done with it. You always give both every day. You always give both no matter the level of skill proficiency. So even if you are in the mastery range of performance and you are giving generalization instruction, you are still working on conceptual understanding. It is not a one and done that you do it before you ever start procedural skill development. It is, mis it is a mischaracterization of math learning to say that conceptual understanding is tantamount or the same as acquisition stage learning. It is not. Conceptual understanding is cultivated in the acquisition stage in the fluency building stage and in the generalization stage, if you are really following the evidence of the science of math and how children learn. Um, it is really important to minimize errors during learning. And this would be the critique. And I know uh, Kirshner presented, which is so amazing. I wish I could have seen it. I'm going to watch the recording. Um, because I was presenting when he was at a, in a different conference, uh, or I would have watched it live. But, you know, this, this notion of what we call minimally guided instruction, which Kirshner calls minimally guided instruction, part of the reason it is so problematic is it does not attend to how deadly errors can be when they occur early in the learning sequence, and especially if they go undetected. Um, Engelman has written about that too in just beautiful ways, so I, I would send you to one of his articles too. And I'm going to say, 
it doesn't mean minimally guided instruction never has a place. I'm, I'm actually optimistic about it that I don't think this has actually been studied in this way. I would actually love to do this study, but what, what we really need to do is think about it as a generalization opportunity. So I encourage you to think about there's not like a specific tactic that works all the time for everybody, no matter the stage of learning with maybe one exception, which is explicit instruction. Um, other than that tactic, it is always a tactic situated in the child's development, their stage of learning, that will tell you whether or not it is likely to be effective. And I hope that makes sense. I hope I have made that sort of more concrete for you as a model today. So for example, if you've got a child who needs fluency building, but you're giving them a ton of antecedent support for correct responding, you will actually worsen learning because you will hit the number, you will reduce the number of opportunities to practice or respond that they can get in their practice interval because you are giving them so much unnecessary antecedent support, if that makes sense. Uh, similarly, if you have a child who is in the acquisition stage of learning and you're giving them timed practice on that skill, you may be doing more harm than good. We would recommend that you not do that. In fact, in my work, if we detect uh, like classified math intervention, for example, which is a fluency building intervention by design, if we detect that your median score is in the frustrational range of performance, we will enable an acquisition lesson with scripted activities to build conceptual understanding um, that you can you would do it with your class first before you come back and attempt fluency building because to do otherwise to give kids fluency building intervention when they needed acquisition support you will actually worsen learning it is a it is just a fact it's the way it works so I really love this notion of thinking about your core instruction as one-third acquisition support one-third fluency building support and one-third um generalization and I'll just make a pitch I'll make a plea to you not to change the term or the the language from fluency to automaticity because you think maybe people will accept it better because behavioral fluency dates back to BF Skinner it is there is just your you know decades of published research with all kinds of you know from animals to humans in adult learning, child learning, that you are sort of saying doesn't matter when you just change the label. So when I talk about fluency, I unapologetically use the word fluency. And I think if people can understand, we're not always cultivating fluency, but when we are, let's call it fluency. It has a specific definition, accuracy plus speed, 1996, Carl Binder's great paper. That's the definition. There's a reason to cultivate that. And primarily that reason is when you get children to a certain level of fluency, which this is the birthplace for curriculum-based measurement it did not come from cognitive science it came from behavioral science when you do that and you get children to certain predictable thresholds or cut scores of performance then you are actually forecasting longer term retention endurance and application performances so that is what for me it's all about when we talk about systematically building fluency so please don't be shy about that just understand it has a place in core instruction um, explicit instruction minimizes and prevents anxiety systematically and it benefits all learners and it's very efficient when children are asked to do something that they do not know how to do, they will feel anxious. I would feel anxious. So it's important that you think about um, if you're, especially if you're somebody who worries about timed assessment causing anxiety, you can't really feel that way on the one hand and then promote things like productive struggle and acquisition on the other hand, because I can make a pretty strong case that if you ask children to get in a group with their peers and wrestle with something they don't know how to do, they're probably going to get real quiet real fast if they don't understand the task. So they're not going to profit totally from that episode. They're going to get now at best a worked model from a student, which may or may not be correct. And the teacher is not really in the middle of that. And I believe the teacher should be 
um, mediating that in a better way. And I believe if you place that at the generalization stage of learning, then the learners can profit from that episode much better. So most teachers really just are not well supported to deliver evidence-based instruction. You're not, we know, we already covered this, you're not going to be equipped with good core curricula. And sometimes our own philosophies can get in our way. So if you can approach things with an open mind, and I hope this has been helpful to you, that you've had a concrete model of how to use instructional science in your core instruction, that hopefully you've come away with some ideas that you can try. And if you're using great progress monitoring assessments in your classroom, you should be able to see the results of that effort, you know, within a day or two. This is not something that takes six months to um, see progress. You should see uh, progress from day to day. Uh, these are my takeaways. Uh, one more slide. Be clear in advance about what your expected outcome of instruction is. That means using instructional calendars, really articulating what am I going to work on this week. Be intentional, intentional both in your sequencing and where you place these, these uh, particular um, skills during the course of the year because some weeks are going to be less productive instructionally than other weeks in very predictable ways like Thanksgiving week is a terrible week to introduce your most important math learning for the fall semester because half the class won't be there on Monday so you can be thoughtful about that you do not have to follow the sequence that is in your textbook again remember it's roughly a zero effect size so the textbook really just becomes one tool that you would choose from to teach particular um, lessons around what you're trying to establish that week. But as the teacher, you need to be the driver of that experience. And your district very likely has instructional calendars and pacing guides. If they don't, we have some on uh, in our support portal that hopefully will be helpful to you. Um, teach the patterns and rules explicitly. Do not wait for children to discover how and why algorithms work, for example, or to discover how certain understandings are connected to past understandings. As the teacher, you should orchestrate and mediate those discoveries to make sure that they actually occur as planned for all learners. That's the key. Um, the children who were going to get it anyway often thrive in discovery learning but it wasn't because of the discovery learning. It's because they were sort of instruction proof. They were going to get it anyway. The children who weren't get really quiet. It goes undetected. And that instruction does not profit them. Do not rely on your textbooks to set the pace, to provide your practice opportunities and drive instruction. Again, it's a zero effect size. And, and some of what's wrong with textbooks is they do not provide well-controlled task materials and adequate practice opportunities. Emphasize always this notion and, and skill of uh, converting harder tasks to easier tasks from pre-K forward. This is, we do this all the time. So teaching children to count up when they are solving a math uh, sum in the early, you know, baby grades, instead of counting both quantities separately to get the total. Um, that that's an example of making it easier to solve or making a five from a quantity and adding one. Um, so there's all kinds of ways you can systematically do that from the baby grades all the way up. Emphasize uh, tool skills. I love this from the Johnson and Street book. Uh, that's Kent Johnson and Libby Street. Um, they just do wonderful work and emphasizing that uh, there really are certain understandings in math that uh, open very broadly doors to the really important understandings. So, you know, I'll give you a concrete example of little kids, like understanding that this is called a triangle is less valuable than being able to discriminate quantity by counting to identify a quantity that is greater or lesser or more or less, which is fine to say with little kids. Um, but emphasizing certain tool skills, one of which is making challenging content into easier content. In other words, converting quantities. So like in, in our instructional protocols, we have about 550 in our particular work. We always, in 100% of these protocols for acquisition and fluency building, we give systematic pro uh, practice and guided support to create equivalent quantities. And I can't emphasize that enough. That's really important. And of course, making the key discrimination really obvious and explicit for the learner. So I think this is great because we've got some time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. We have a ton of questions popping in the chat, so we will get to as many as we can, um, and then our session closes 
at 1045, right about 1044, I will show the slide. Um, Mitch just put the link to the presentation with all of these uh, great things in here. So I'm going to kind of scroll back a little bit. Um, people were asking about the support portal. So that's available just through Spring Math if you're a Spring Math user, correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'll tell you what, like if you're listening in today and you want a particular instructional calendar, just shoot me an email and I will send it to you. Okay, excellent. Um, another question anonymously, uh, what, can, what can you say when teachers... What should they do whenever the majority of their class is below benchmark? Um, and you have to teach this number of standards to stay on with pacing directed by your administration. Does that rule of thirds still apply? What happens when they're not ready for generalization? How yep. do you adapt, but still progress with your students with grade level content? Yeah. I mean, Erica, you love that question, right? I do. <laughs> Me too. I mean, it's the right question. We get it all the time. I honestly think, I just want to say this. I think it's kind of, you have to be a little bit brave to deliver effective instruction, to follow the science. You really do in a classroom because the fear in math is that there's so much to cover. And so I got to race forward or I'm not going to get to it. I'm not going to cover the content. All right. We actually ran a little mini study. We didn't publish it, but we, I, I would be happy to share the data. I, we have summarized the data and actually have a little piece on it that I could share with you. But we found like, for example, when teachers feel that pressure and they make a decision to just go ahead and move on, whether children have reached mastery or not in an in instructional sequence, like in class-wide intervention, their future probability of um, mastery plummets to zero on subsequent skills because math is relentlessly hierarchical. That's one finding. And then, of course, the impetus for this is that they'll be able to cover more content. And the actual data tell us they also don't, they fail on that too. They're not able to cover more content because the children did not have the necessary prerequisite skills. And this is why I say it takes some bravery because of course you feel that pressure. I've got to teach grade level content. I have limited time to get everybody um, to mastery on the grade level expected understandings. And at the end of the day, you have to be able to face yourself in that mirror, that very unforgiving mirror and understand that just because you present it real fast in order and get it all out there does not mean you've done your job as a teacher at actually assisting the children to master the understandings. And the only way you can do that sometimes is to backfill the deficits or the gaps. And so what I'm going to tell you, when you have a scenario where most children are below benchmark, you must supplement with high quality class-wide math intervention. Um, I have a model for that that I use all over very successfully. We had a school in Arizona just that, that went from 17% proficient to 43% proficient on the year-end tests this year alone with one year of use of high quality, pretty, pretty well implemented class-wide math intervention. They did that at third grade. Um, so there's another model, the PALS model, that would be Lynn and Doug Fuchs or Doug and Lynn Fuchs, I guess I should say for the PALS model. Um, and Again, this is really an important and necessary dimension of MTSS because when you have most children not at benchmark, you also can't identify who really needs intensified instruction in that context. So class-wide intervention is now a standard part and should be a standard part of most people's MTSS models. We consider it tier 1.5 and the research data we have is probably what I have studied the most. It's a wonderful framework to study all kinds of learning questions. So we just have years of studies and we see all kinds of rapid, efficient closing of opportunity gaps. We take kids who happen to be on IEPs, who happen to get randomly assigned uh, are in are on rosters in general ed that are randomly assigned to class-wide intervention versus kids on IEPs who are on rosters that happen to get randomly assigned to business as usual control. The control group is about 43 proficient percent proficient on the year-end test, and the kids on IEPs in the treatment group are, so instead of 43 percent, 
are above 80% proficient on the year-end test from a randomized controlled trial. We can't find subgroups who do not benefit from class-wide intervention, and we study it. We look for them all the time. In fact, we are learning all kinds of things about dosage of class-wide intervention and understanding that even the better the dosage, the better the classification accuracy when you identify who needs tier three using class-wide intervention as your basis, which always outperforms the static screeners. We are seeing um, gains on high stakes tests really for, and you're not supposed to say that anymore, year-end tests, I guess, um, for just about every subgroup we can think to look at. It's a highly efficient process. And, um, and I just cannot encourage you enough that, that that's a clear answer from the science for me, that if you've got most kids not at benchmark, you really need to supplement with class-wide intervention. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Kind of next topic. Um, uh, sometimes I get pushback from um, parents of students who maybe are, are high ability, high achieving. Uh, this individual teaches second grade and has a hard time allowing them to move on and work independently when they do make errors and things like regrouping. Any suggestions on how to explain that explicit instruction is beneficial for all students? Yeah, isn't that interesting? Like some kind of way, I, maybe it was the way it was labeled or some of the early scripting and direct instruction that caused it to just be such a PR nightmare. And I think it's really important for us as adults to just sort of be, you know, be curious, be willing to use what works. And uh, remember, explicit instruction does kind of have this sort of broadly misunderstood, it needs a PR makeover yet again, because I think people imagine it as being kind of heavy handed and not leaving space for children to think and not sort of honoring that children are individual creatures, but explicit instruction in real classrooms, is, as you know, because you asked this question, is really not that way. Explicit instruction is this sort of um, orchestrated volleys of responding between the teacher and the learner using specific tools and tasks that really help children rapidly get to mastery. And as you said, you know, if you have uh, worries from parents who say, but my child is so talented, I want you to put them in more challenging content, that's easy to check, right? If you if that's true, certainly they could be accelerated. I've got a, a buddy uh, in the school psych world who uh, during COVID asked me to help her with her two children. And so I was it's, I was sending them uh, literally instructional protocols every week. She would send me their scores. Then I would adjust the, give them the next instructional protocol. Both of those children are now working well below grade level. They've, they aced their school assessments every year now. They probably would have anyway. They've got great parents. I mean, just being honest, is they're, they're smart kids, good horsepower, all of that. But these would fit in that category. Um, but again, that's something you verify, right? And I would say like what we encourage teachers to do is, first of all, class-wide intervention is where sometimes that worry comes up. Like, is this actually valuable to uh, my high-performing students? And the answer is yes, especially if they're not running out of practice problems, they are going to grow. So the key is just to make sure they have enough practice opportunities and they also will experience growth. So it should be fairly rare that you have occasion where you, that 12 to 15 minutes of your day is not a good use of any student's time. Okay, because it's going to benefit the low performers, kids on IEPs, high performers, it benefits everybody. Again, we can't find a subgroup that does not benefit. So what I would say about that, though, is if you've just in the rarest of ways, you've got a second grade kid who's working, you know, heads and shoulders way ahead of the rest of your class, that you would say there's not even any social benefit to that child of being a, a, a partner in this class-wide um, math intervention, then you could always, but it should be rare, and parents never think it's rare. I've, I'm a parent. I know it is a vulnerable place. We never think it's rare. We all think our child is truly different from everybody else. Um, but at the end of the day, you can go, you could go and pull more challenging related um, practice materials and ad advanced um, understandings, and you could give the child that opportunity to practice during when the rest of the class is doing class-wide intervention, for sure. All right, awesome. I think we have time for one or two more. A couple of folks have asked, is it okay if they email you directly to get the sequence of, of skills? Um, for class. Yeah, is it available online? 
somewhere or could they email you for that? Uh, they're probably asking about what 145 skills, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's online. So let me just show you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait. I don't know if I go away from that. It might mess things up. Let me just take you to it. Uh, the benefit of responding here. Okay, where am I going? This is the benefit of being virtual, right? I can just show you how to get to it. So if you go to uh, my site is springmath.org and then you scroll down to the bottom and you say resources right here, it's going to take you to uh, FAQs, top item there. And if you scroll down a little bit, uh, that's our screening skills, you're gonna see view a list of tool skills assessed, okay? And this is our 145 things that we target. And we connect these I, these particular skills, you know, so it's not a, I just did a session yesterday on assessment and math. That, oh, I'm doing that a similar kind of session today. It's not 145 disparate disconnected skills. They all kind of live in these threads of understanding. That's the way we think about it. And I'm going to be talking about that in the uh, assessment session that I'm doing later today.